Counter-Strike has come a long way. While the entire series may not be adorned in game awards and sales records, its influence on gaming culture is still being felt today. Like a flashbang, it made its presence known in the brightest, loudest way possible and left the rest of the industry reeling. And in some ways, gaming has never recovered. The first ever Counter-Strike began its life in 1999 as a humble Half-Life mod created by Min Guzman Lee and managed by Jess Cliff. Inspired by games like Rainbow Six and Spec Ops that had come out the year prior, Lee was particularly interested in making a multiplayer FPS that would attract the attention of game developers after he graduated from university. Cliff was mostly in charge of attracting that attention, creating a website and managing the growing community for their little project. But things didn't remain little for long. In just over a few short months, Counter-Strike would begin its run as one of the most influential games to ever touch the FPS genre, esports community, and overall gaming industry. They released the game in waves of betas for feedback, and the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. The simple concept of terrorists and counter-terrorists facing off against one another on various maps across the world proved to be incredibly popular. Now, this shouldn't be incredibly surprising, given what the geopolitical landscape of the late 90s and early thousands looked like across the world, but especially in the United States. Not unlike the phenomenon that affected the GTA series, CS benefited from the culture at the time because it was being used as an outlet to work through the fear and anxiety a lot of people were experiencing. It wasn't just the concept that was appealing, though. While Counter-Strike's early inspiration shone through quite clearly, it was also doing something entirely new. Viewing the original Counter-Strike from a modern perspective makes it look and feel pretty typical. Just another stock standard FPS. But CS only looks familiar now because it was a pioneer in its time. Things like the ability to purchase equipment with in-game money and having several different objective types weren't exactly standards of the genre at the time. Then you have the more realistic weapons and gameplay. No other game around had quite the same feel. It was technical, fast-paced, and required a level of skill and accuracy that fostered an almost addictive playstyle. With each beta release, new features were added and tweaks were made. If you and your friend both played CS and you took a week off, your friend was bound to be better than you by the time you returned. So a serious competitive scene surrounded even those first few months of playtesting. By the time the year 2000 rolled around, Lee and Cliff got the attention they were looking for from none other than the developers of the game they were modding. Yeah, Valve. The visionaries behind Half-Life had eyes on this college modding project. If we've learned anything from how companies react to game mods, it's that there was a 50-50 chance Lee and Cliff were about to get shut down. But Valve saw the potential in Counter-Strike. The company offered them both jobs if they were willing to continue development. They accepted and Counter-Strike was officially released on PC a few months later under Valve and Sierra Studios. So this game mod had become a fully-fledged game with a built-in audience in about a year of public development and playtesting. That's already quite the story. But we've barely begun to scratch the surface of Counter-Strike's effect on gaming, for better and worse. The fast-paced, skill-based, highly addictive gameplay we described earlier was the backbone for Counter-Strike's success upon release. The game was the perfect place for players to test their skills, and as such, competitive tournaments sprouted up almost immediately. But this was an age where not everyone owned a computer or had a strong enough internet connection to actually play the game. Enter Internet Cafes. These were home to many early 2000s CS tournaments, but they were also used for more casual playing. The symbiotic relationship between gamers and internet cafes that Counter-Strike helped create is often underplayed. While CS was certainly not the only game being played in these publicly available spaces, it was popular enough that Valve would go on to create a cyber cafe program where cafe owners would subscribe monthly and gain access to a ton of Valve games on their PCs. And that program is still active today. For those who weren't conscious or even alive during the time before high-speed internet, it may be hard to imagine a building dedicated to providing people with access to the World Wide Web. But even today, some places rely heavily on internet cafes. And it's not uncommon to see a few monitors lit up with the familiar beige color palette of the original Counter-Strike. It's a testament to just how popular CS was, and is, that people were willing to go out of their way to pay to use a computer in public just to get in a few matches or spend an afternoon watching and participating in competitive play. This level of dedication would go on to define the entire community and dictate the trajectory of the series on the whole. Those who played Counter-Strike often lived and breathed it. 
Once they felt they'd mastered the game, its maps, and its three objectives, there were a couple of routes experienced players could take. Either keep playing until you're good enough to win tournaments, or turn to mods. Valve has always actively encouraged mods, and essentially provided all the necessary tools to make them, and then left players with their own devices. This laid-back, open-ended approach led to some truly inspired pieces of work in the CS community. Some mods added new game modes and massively changed gameplay, where others just tweaked the experience or implemented brand new maps. Many of these mods became officially unofficial aspects of CS or other games all on their own. Counter-Strike had become so much bigger than Lee's original vision. There was a sense of community ownership that reinforced the loyal foundation of the fanbase. They were there through it all including the middling-reviewed, mostly disappointing 2004 sequel, Counter-Strike Condition Zero. But thankfully, players had something to look forward to that same year. Counter-Strike Source was pretty much universally adored. That's probably because it was a remake of the original game on the Source engine. In the early 2000s, gamers just weren't ready to let go of that first game. That step would come about eight years later. The release of Counter-Strike Global Offensive in 2012 changed the game. Literally and figuratively, CSGO continues to collect game awards to this day and elevated the series into world-renowned stardom. It improved the already near-perfect gameplay, looked and ran better on most hardware, provided gaming YouTubers with a decade of content, and cemented the series' place in the esports arena. Yeah, remember those aforementioned tournaments? By 2012, they would become the most important facet of the CS community. As early as 2000, the Cyber Athlete Professional League started hosting official Counter-Strike tournaments. At the time, CPL was at the forefront of esports. And while they had been hosting single-player game comps since the late 90s, CS really jump-started the team-based multiplayer side of the equation. Other organizations have since picked up where CPL left off, but Counter-Strike, and particularly CSGO, have always been a part of the movement. But today, games built either consciously or unconsciously off of the legacy of Counter-Strike are now meeting or surpassing it in popularity. That doesn't mean CSGO is going anywhere, though. There's still a thriving player base created in those early years. But when a community or a competitive online game is that big and that loyal, there are bound to be problems. Thus far, we've been highly complimentary of Counter-Strike, and deservedly so. But its influence on gaming culture hasn't always been positive. Counter-Strike players were long known as the most toxic community out there. Cheating was rampant, smurfing and griefing was expected, and harassment is still accepted as part of the gameplay experience. While other games have since taken the shameful, most toxic title, that doesn't mean CS all well and good. This type of community was largely allowed to form because of Valve's hands-off approach to moderation. Much like their attitudes towards game mods, they decided to take a backseat on dealing with a lot of the worst issues that plagued the Counter-Strike community. And where that laid-back attitude was appreciated when it came to player creativity, it was less ideal when it came to game moderation. That lack of moderation continued to be an issue as Counter-Strike's popularity spiked with CSGO. There have been a few high-profile cheating scandals over the years, but the most damning, non-harassment-based problem CS faces is gambling. Weapon skins have been a part of CSGO since 2013. Like any game with cosmetics, these skins became extremely hot commodities. An economy formed around their rarity, and people started to pay real-life money for the most sought-after ones. This essentially made weapon skins into a virtual currency. And what do you do with highly valued virtual currency? You gamble with it. In the 2010s, a lot of skin gambling was unregulated, straight-up illegal, and often targeted at children. In some cases, it's still like that today. And as recently as 2019, it was confirmed that CSGO microtransactions were being used in money laundering operations. Now, plenty of games have been home to this kind of predatory system, but CSGO is infamous for the sheer amount of money spent. Even the legal licensed gambling sites boast that they've seen over $2 billion wagered. So Counter-Strike will always be looked back on as a great series. It popularized game mechanics that have become standard for the genre, it kept internet cafes going for years, it helped lay the groundwork for the esports boom, and it formed a community so airtight that they're still playing a 10-year-old game at a competitive level today. But it will also be remembered for its detrimental effect on gaming. It did its part to normalize toxicity in multiplayer games. It's being used for predatory gambling schemes and fraud. 
And while Min Lee deserves praise for envisioning and creating a gaming icon, it's Valve who is left with the bulk of Counter-Strike's continued legacy. For better or worse, the company's hands-off community-driven approach has turned CS into what it is today. And that's where we'll leave you. If you're still here, make sure to like this video, subscribe to Nerdstalgic Gaming, and let us know in the comments. What's your opinion on the state of the Counter-Strike series today?